Good afternoon, and welcome to Convent, our Wednesday Bible study. And I want to acknowledge our pastor, the Reverend Dr. Jesse T. Williams, Jr., and the Reverend Dr. Charlene Faison, our chair of Board of Christian Education. I want to thank them for this opportunity to teach this lesson today. My name is Linda Murray, and I am an associate minister here at Convent Avenue Baptist Church. Now, I trust that all of you had a safe and a happy July 4th holiday. Many of us did. But we want to pause just for uh, a short moment to offer prayers and condolences for those who lost family members and friends in the Chicago shooting in Highland Park on July 4th. We also offer prayers for those who are or, or injured and for our nation uh, as a whole, because it is in turmoil spiritually and politically and we are in a recession now, we look to God and offer uh, this prayer for the general unrest that is amongst us. So in the midst of this church gathered virtually today, we want to offer prayers for comfort and healing and we do want to offer praise to our God because our God is still in control and he hears our every prayer, even the faintest cry, our God hears because he is amazing. Amen? Amen. So today we begin the fifth and the final part of our Max Licato's uh, devotional book, Begin Again. And in this section of his book, we encounter, or he encourages us to nurture the eternal perspective. He says that we'll, we, we'll review a chapter 18 today, and, which is entitled, reserve judgment of life storms. The scriptural basis for our study today is 1 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 12. Uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 12. And reading from the NIV, it reads thus. Now I know in part, then shall I know even as also I am known. 1 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 12. And so let's start our study. But first, let us pray. Our Father and our God, we thank you and we praise you for this time that you have allowed us to gather together in your presence, Lord. You say that you never leave us nor forsake us because your spirit lives within us and guides us into all truth. So we ask, Lord God, at this hour, at this time, that you would uh, be in our ears and in our heart and minds that what we hear from your word, Lord, that we would put it into practice, and that it would give you the glory and the honor that is due your name. We ask it all in the name of Jesus, our Lord and Savior and soon coming King, amen. So, the first thing I wanna look at is the nurturing of this eternal perspective that uh, Mr. Lucado introduces. The statement, nurture and eternal perspective, actually comes from his, uh, the pages or notations of his personal diary or journey, journal. He states, I spent a year in a subway one hour. When great expectations came to those on the subway platforms, we expected to reach home as we entered or boarded the train. It pulls off, but comes to a halt in the mid middle of a tunnel. The lights go off, the motor shuts down, there are sighs, there are moans, there are groans which express their frustration and their concerns about being stuck in a dark, inky night of an underground passage, a confined space with no word from the outside. This is how it seems for billions, Locato says. The world, says Locato, seems like a stalled subway train going nowhere with no message from the conductor. This is the picture of life without heaven. No light at the end of the tunnel, no home at the end of the journey. Life without heaven, says the coddle, feels like we're stuck and there's chaos all around. But Jesus spends two thirds of his parables telling of the resurrection and the afterlife, heaven. 
He wants us to know that the train that we are on is moving to the final destination, to our final station. Remain in your seats, the voice crackled, and we'll be moving soon. Happy, Lucado says, are the homebound, the homeward bound pilgrims. So, now we'll look at this chapter 18, Reserve Judgment of Life Storms. There are storms in our lives. There are places that we would rather not be, conditions and situations that come before us that we really would rather not be in that space. For our lesson today also comes from the memoirs of Lakato. He tells of his desire to learn to be patient. He's living in Sao Paulo, Brazil at the time, and he's trying to make adjustments to the culture and the proper pronunciation of the Portuguese language, and he's having some problems with that. But success does come through the understanding of a story that was given to him by his mentor. Uh, it, it was a story or a fable about a woodcutter who lived with his son, and apparently he's rather poor but he was envied nonetheless by all of the villagers, those that he lived amongst, including the king himself, because he owned a beautiful white horse. His neighbors and other villagers thought that he should sell the horse and use the money to take care of himself and his son. But the woodcutter thought of the horse as a person. He thought of him as a friend, and he asked the question, how can you sell a friend? Now, there are several types of friendships. One is an intimate friendship, an intimate friend. Uh, the people that we have in our lives, like our families and our friends who we call running buddies. And then there are friends who are considered just so, work companions or cordial, casual friends. And there are those who are just uh, friends that we see along the way, people that we exchange good morning or good evenings with, uh, there is a sense that uh, we don't really know them, but we just treat them with respect. So we have this idea of several uh, levels of friendship. The woodcutter says that this horse is a personal friend of his, a person. How can you sell a friend? When I was thinking about this, it came to my mind very quickly, this idea of uh, the thought of Judas selling his friend. He sold his friend for 30 pieces of silver. There are four crises and encounters between the old woodcutter and the villagers that he lives amongst. They supposedly shed light on how uh, one learns to be patient. This is what Locato is trying to get us to understand how he learned to be patient as he followed the fable of the woodcutter. The first uh, crisis that comes in the woodcutter's life is that his horse is not in the stable. And the villagers call uh, upon the woodcutter. They come to him and they're supposedly going to offer him solace, but instead uh, they, they call him a fool. They say he's foolish because his horse was stolen and they had told him that if he sold the horse that he could use the money, but now the horse is gone and he has nothing. How stupid. The response from the woodcutter, don't speak so quickly. Say only that the horse is not in the stable. That's all we know. The rest is judgment. How can you know if I'm cursed or blessed? All we see are fragments. Who can say? The second crisis comes when the horse returns with 12 other horses and the villagers come again. They come to the woodcutter and say, you were right. What we thought was a curse was a blessing. Please forgive us. The response, again, you go too far. Say only the horse is back with a dozen other horses, but don't judge. How do you know if it's a blessing or not? You see only a fragment. Unless you know the whole story, how can you judge? Life is so vast, yet you judge all of life with one page or one word. All you know is a fragment. 
Don't say this is a blessing. No one knows. I am content with what I know, not per perturbed by what I don't know. The villagers say, maybe the old man is right. But deep down inside, they know, they think, they believe that he is wrong. It was a blessing. They were looking at the profit, again, that the money from the horses may produce. The third crisis. The old man's son breaks both legs while training the horses, and the villagers come. They cast judgment. You were right. You were right. The horses were not a blessing. They were a curse. The old man never said that. He never said that the horses were a blessing. He only said, say this only. His response again is say, only say my son broke his legs. You have no one to help you, uh, they say to him. Uh, they, of course, did not offer to help the old man. You people are obsessed with judging, he says. Say only my son broke his legs. Who knows if it is a blessing or a curse? No one knows. We only know a fragment. Life comes in fragments. The fourth crisis, war comes. War comes to the, to the country and all the villagers' sons are taken by the army. The old man's son, however, remains because he has broken his legs. And the villagers come crying and lamenting to the, to the woodcutter. Our sons have been taken, probably uh, won't return either. You were right, old man. God knows you were right. This proves it. Your son's accident was a blessing. Now this all sounds very well and good. They're talking about uh, how the old man was right, uh, and they even say that God knows that you were right. But again, they're judging. They're making conclusions before all of the evidence is in. Your son's accident was a blessing, they say. And in response, the woodcutter says, it is impossible to talk to you. You always draw conclusions. No one knows. Say only this, your sons had to go to war and mine did not. No one knows if it is a blessing or a curse. No one is wise enough to know. Only God knows. The cutter says, I don't know where the woodcutter learned patience perhaps from another woodcutter in Galilee. The carpenter who said it best, do not worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will worry about itself. Matthew 6, 34. He should know he is the guide of our journey and the author of the story. He has charted the course and written the final chapter, reminding us of Psalm 48, 14. This God is our God forever and ever. He will be our guide even forever, the New Revised Standard Version. Hebrew 12, 2, looking unto Jesus, the author and the finisher of our faith, King James Version. Without question, credit for all the old man's responses to the uh, comments of the villagers as he experiences the various cri crises goes to 1 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 12. Now I know in part, then I shall know fully, even as I am fully known. First Corinthians chapter 13 is often called the love chapter and it's recited at weddings to underscore the foundation of the ideal marriage. The original context of the letter, however, and its intent of the chapter is obscured when it is used only in this way. So let's read the entire chapter. 1 Corinthians chapter 13. If I speak with the tongues of men and of angels, but have not love, I am only a resounding gong or a clanging cymbal. If I have the gift of prophecy and can fashion all mysteries and all knowledge, and if I have faith that can move mountains, but have not love, I am nothing. If I give all I possess to the poor and surrender my body to the flames, but I have not love, I gain nothing. Love is patient, love is kind. It does not envy, it does not boast, it is not proud, it is not rude, it is not self-seeking. It is not easily angered, it keeps no record of wrong. 
Love does not delight in evil, but rejoices with the truth. It always protects, always trusts, always hopes, always perseveres. Love never fails. But where there are prophecies, they will cease. Whether there are tongues, they will be stilled. Whether there is knowledge, it will pass away. For we know in part, and we prophesy in part. But when the perfectness come, the imperfect disappears. When I was a child, I talked like a child, I thought like a child, I reasoned like a child. When I became a man, I put away or put behind me childish things. Now we see but a poor reflection as in a mirror. Then we shall see face to face. Now I know in part, then shall I know fully, even as I am fully known. Now these three remain, faith, hope, and love but the greatest of these is love. 1 Corinthians chapter 13, the New International Version. So, Paul writes this uh, chapter uh, 13, and the letter we call 1 Corinthians. Uh, the church at Corinth was established by Paul during his second missionary journey, arriving there probably in the spring of AD 51, after an unsuccessful time in Athens. Paul is there for one and a half years preaching and teaching the gospel of Jesus Christ. Corinth was an important, some say the most important commercial city of southern Greece, a Roman province, second only to Rome itself. Famous not only for its wealth, its wealthy seaport connecting trades from all over the then known world because of the isthmus allowing uh, the movement of the cargo across land uh, between the Aegean and Adriatic seas and keeping them from having to go around the famous Peloponnesus uh, where so many ships were lost because of, of storms, uncontrollable storms. So uh, Corinth is a very famous place to be. It was, however, uh, a place of idolatrous lifestyle. It was called Fun City of its time and famous for its temple of Aphrodite, the goddess of love with her 1,000 female prostitutes and the temple of Apollo, the god of music, the song of poetry and the god of male beauty with its male prostitution. There was also the temple of Poseidon, the god of the sea and he is also known as ba by Baal. You remember Baal? He was the primary uh, god of Tyre and Sidon, who was previously introduced to Israel by Ahaz and Jezebel, and how it created such havoc in the, the place for Israel. Its roots can be traced to 8,000 BC, this city of Corinth. It was destroyed by Rome in 146 BC, and it was dormant for 100 years until Rome reestablished it in 46 BC. Corinth has a long history of idolatrous worship and living. Uh, it was uh, famous for its uh, following of transcendental meditation and its secret uh, knowing of Gnosticism. They were enamored with the idea of knowledge greater than themselves, of the mystery religions and the mysteries that no one could figure out. And when or if they had the gift of, of speaking gifts, they thought themselves better than the other uh, people in, of the Corinthian church. Paul writes 1 Corinthians in approximately AD 55 while in Ephesus during his third missionary journey. He has received reports of problems in the church at Corinth, disunity, favoritism and loyalty to special leaders rather than the devotion to Christ, gross immorality, taking each other to secular courts for judgment, inappropriate use of the Lord's Supper and spiritual gifts. In chapter three, Paul chides them for being worldly, that is carnal. There, there is a jealousy and a quarreling among you. You're acting like people of the world, mere men implying that they're not like people of God. They lack self-discipline, 1 Corinthians 9, 24 through 27. 
Many of these problems plague our world today and the church today. Paul emphasizes in order to live as Christ commands us, we must give attention to his love for us, agape love, sacrificial love, which actually encompasses the other three words for love or descriptions of love. Eros is the intimate type of sexual love that one has for one's spouse. Phileo is the brotherly or respectful love that one has for uh, his friend. And sarge is the love of family or intimate friends. In explaining this agape love, Paul presents a list of how it should be or how we should live out and how we should do uh, what we need or how we act in love. The first characteristics on the to-do list, love is patient. The King James says, love suffers long. It comes from our word agonize. It means to struggle or to wrestle with. In other words, love don't come easy, the songwriter says. It's a game of give and take. We must work at learning to love. Paul takes it from uh, the work ethic or the workouts that the athletes do to prepare themselves for the Ithamithian games uh, or sports that was held every two years in Corinth. Also the preparation of the Roman soldiers uh, that they do to prepare themselves to be battle ready. The sacrifice of our wants and desires for the good of another can cause discomfort, physical discomfort and or emotional discomfort. No pain, We've all heard this one, no gain. Synonyms for patience include humility, self-restraint, endurance, diligence, submissiveness, steadfastness, tolerance. It's associated with composure or calmness under pressure. And in his letter to the Galatians from uh, Galatians 5, or we, which was written five to six years earlier, in AD 49, Paul identifies patience as a fruit of the spirit, a virtue essential to the believer's walk, their growth in and with God and with one another. We also heard the wood talk, woodcutter talk a lot about judgment, judgmental attitudes. This is one of someone who labels, who are excessively critical or critically confrontational. They're closed-minded, they're opinionated, they rush to conclusions, they mock people, they taunt them. There is a lack of respect for the person who is being criticized. They're harsh and they're non-reasonable. They believe that their criticism is true. This old man said, I can't talk with you. That's what he told the villagers. He also speaks about knowing. To know is to see. In verse 12, Paul uses for the second time this idea of knowing. He mentions knowing in part and the expectation of complete knowing in a forthcoming time. Verses nine and 10, for we know in part and we prophesy in part, but when the perfect comes, the imperfect will disappear. Again in verse 12, it alludes to the infamous statement about the mirror that reflects images so poorly. They are distorted, these images, and really they present a mystery to us, an enigma to us. They're not easily understood. And while Corinth was famous for its mirrors made of polished brass, nonetheless, there were problems with the clarity that was seen when people tried to use that metal mirror. It was not until the 1200s that mirrors that we use today were made of glass with silver coatings on the back that we are able to see images with relative clarity. So, Paul says, now we know, we see poorly, then we shall know, we shall see face to face. Now I know in part, 
we shall understand because, then, because I don't see clearly. Then shall I know fully, even as I am fully known. Now and then, the full, complete knowledge, seeing and understanding will occur at the second coming of Jesus. So when is this second coming? Is that the rapture? Is that the tribulation? Is it the millennial kingdom, this now and then, this fullness, this time when we will see clearly? The appearance of the new heaven and the new earth is what most commentators settle on. The dwelling place of God will be with men according to Revelation 21.3 when the new heaven and the new earth come. No more dim reflections of God. Those of us who trust Christ as our Redeemer, even as we speak, are being fitted for such a time as that. Our knowledge about God and our reality now is only partial. We will then learn more fully and continue throughout our time in eternity to learn of God. Paul tells us we shall see him. John reminds us in 1 John chapter 3, verse 2. Dear friends, now are we the children of God, and we will be, has not yet been known. And what we will be has not yet been known. But we know that when he appears, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is, that is, see him face to face. We shall be like him perfect in power, in love, and purity. Everyone who has this hope in him purifies himself just as he is pure. The songwriter says, when we all get to heaven, what a day of rejoicing that will be. When we all see Jesus, we will sing and we will shout the victory. We will shout the victory because we will see him face to face. When I saw that, it really kind of puzzled me. How can we see God face to face? Because uh, we have to ask the question, does God have a literal face? Is it a physical face? The scripture teaches that God is spirit. And so we have to wonder uh, why Paul says that. We cannot see him face to face. Is that so? We know that Moses and Jacob claimed to see God. Whether it was face to face was another issue. Moses saw the backside of God, or as God passed, he saw God. And even that was a tremendous light for him. Uh, God is so pure, you see, the brightness of his glory, the light that we see would be destructive if we saw it with the eyes that we have now. Uh, it would burn us and consume us with fire. But Jesus has come. John says that Jesus is the light. He is the light of the world. He has come and we can see the face of God in the true and living God, the true God, Jesus the Christ, the anointed one. He is the one who was made in the image of God. He is the brightness of God's glory. So we turn our eyes upon Jesus and we look full in his wonderful face. As the things of earth, the storms of life grow strangely dim in the light of his glory and grace. So we bless God for uh, Paul and his writing of 1 Corinthians chapter 13, verse uh, 12, which says that we shall indeed see him as he is, though we know in part now, then we shall know even as also we are full, fully known. We shall be like him. Amen? Let us close in prayer. Our Father and our God, we thank you for this scripture that you have given us today to look into your word and to try to understand what it means um, that we only know partially now. But we thank you, Lord God, that when we get home, 
we will be with you forever and we will continually learn of the things that are so poignant about you, so wonderful. And we praise you and we thank you that Jesus came to die for our sins, that we would have that opportunity and that his spirit leads and guides us day by day, hour by hour, our comforter and our guide. We thank you in Jesus' name, amen.